All right, everybody, in a routine Matt fashion, we are coming back with another video after six months of being absent. So congratulations. Thank you for sticking around. I wanted to talk about this scene in Advent Children Complete. Now, I was watching the movie with my girlfriend the other night and just just seeing like what was up and I hadn't watched it in a while. And I'm watching this scene where Kadaj and Rufus are talking on the rooftop building, right? You see that in the scene right before they fight Bahamut Sin. And Rufus has this really interesting bit, he says, about the live stream that made me think about, you know, with these recent translations from Toriyama, how this could allude to the future plot of Final Fantasy VII Remake and how this predicted the remake before we even knew about it. Now, unfortunately, I don't want to show you guys the scene because I could get in trouble with, you know, copyright and I don't want Square Enix coming after me. So I will read you the script, courtesy of the livestream.net. Rufus, the livestream courses through our world ever flowing between the edge of life and death. If that cycle is the very truth of life, then history too will inevitably repeat itself. Go on, bring your Genovas and your Sephiroths. Cause trouble till your heart's content. We'll do as life mandates, we promise. We won't let you win, and we'll stop you. Now it's easy to interpret this scene as just alluding to the fact that they've beaten Sephiroth before, they're dealing with the Geostigma, and they're taking on Kadaj and the Remnant, saying, we're not going to back down, we're not going to give in, keep coming, we're going to keep fighting you back, it's never going to end. But as you know, with the internet, and myself included as a Final Fantasy VII fan, anything in this compilation now, now that we've experienced Remake, and the crazy timelines, the crazy twists and turns, and all the different things that we can experience or think about what is actually happening in the story now, everything almost can be seen as a signal to what is going to come in the next game. Now the first line Rufus says is, The life stream courses through our world, ever flowing between the edge of life and death. Now to interpret this line, we need to back up and talk about the recent book that was released earlier this month called the Final Fantasy VII Remake Ultimania Plus booklet, which was only released in Japan so far. Thanks to a great Twitter user by the name of Audrey, aka Aitai Kimochi, I believe her name is, we're able to actually get some translations from this book directly from a person who is bilingual. Matomo Toriyama, the co-director of Final Fantasy VII Remake, was actually featured in this book to give insight and clarification into certain scenes that we thought said more than what we thought. When asked about Jesse's gloves appearing in the ending scene of Final Fantasy VII Remake when the whispers are destroyed and ultimately the timeline has been freed from the original game's script and plot, he answered with this. In the ending scene where Biggs wakes up, Jesse's bandana and gloves are laid out on the desk. Does this mean she's alive? Well, we do see Biggs alive in the ending scene since he's physically shown. On the other hand, Jesse is not shown in the ending because we couldn't save her. Or that's what you might think. If Biggs' life can be saved by some miracle, then that means other members could be saved too. Perhaps Jesse might also be spared or not. However, an important theme of this story is loss. If all characters you see are able to survive in the future, then perhaps that would be in a different world. Now, if you've completed Final Fantasy VII Remake, and you've completed the DLC intermission that featured Yuffie, you'd know that there were drastic changes to the original game that made the ending to that game very interpretive, and a lot of people theorize what is actually going on. The most important thing he says in that interview answer is right there at the end. However, an important theme of this story is loss. If all characters you see are able to survive in the future, then perhaps that would be in a different world. Now when Rufus says the life stream courses between the edge of life and death, it makes me think about in Final Fantasy VII Remake how we have two different timelines going on. We have a timeline of Cloud in the party, and we have a timeline of whatever Zack is doing in his timeline. Now these two things could be interpreted as two different timelines, but now I feel like they're interpreted as two different worlds after what Toriyama says. A world of life, featuring Cloud and the party on their way to Calm, and a world of death, featuring Zack's timeline where Aerith could already be dead, and Jesse is possibly alive along with Sonan and other party members, while Zack experiences his own journey in Final Fantasy VII Remake. When Zack enters the church after not seeing Aerith for four years, Wondering what he's going to say to her, he opens the doors, and he does not see Aerith there, but he sees a collection of people that look awfully upset, grieving, or frustrated. Now when I first saw this scene, I thought that these were simply people taking refuge 
from the plate falling because they had nowhere else to go. But if we're really looking at the chronological timeline of events, if Zack had got to Midgar after defeating the soldiers, the plate fall would not have happened yet because the bombing of the first reactor would not have happened yet. So when I saw this scene, I interpret this very differently now that I think that there's a theory of a world of death. Essentially what I want to say is, let's say Zack's timeline or world of death in the live stream is completely different from the world Cloud and them experience and does not have the same turn of events. This could just simply be that he showed up at the church, Aerith was not there because she hadn't died in the original timeline yet, and these are people that have died in whether it was the bombing of the first reactor, the second reactor, or the plate fall. You could interpret their grieving or their sadness as saying like, okay, maybe Aerith is dead in this timeline and they're just simply sad and they miss her. But also I can interpret this as people waking up from a very traumatic and stressful nightmare. A traumatic and stressful nightmare of thinking or witnessing or experiencing that they died in the world of life. Like, oh, I died. I, I think something crushed me or whatever, I, I swear it happened. But then they're in this church awoken in this possible new world and they don't know how to interpret it, but it was so traumatic that they feel this relief and they're crying it out. As I said, man, this is just some theorizing. There's plenty of things to disprove this, like, you know, Cloud being in that world, even though he did not die. It could be possibly due to him being in a Mako coma that he's bordering between the edge of life and death when he's in that state. You know, that's going to happen later on in the plot of Final Fantasy VII. Or, you know, it could just be the fact that Aerith is dead in this timeline and there's nothing else like Zack can do except start his own different kind of journey. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for, you know, putting up with my interpretation of what Rufus is saying in Advent Children. I could be onto something. I could just be talking out of my ass. But nevertheless, you know, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking your time to watch this. And, you know, if you have any other ideas that builds off of the theory that I have, you can certainly post them in the comments and I'll try to keep up with you guys and have a conversation about that. With that being said, have a great day. I'm hopefully going to be on Twitch streaming later. So you guys take care and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.